a little bit more on China, just to put this up there on the screen. This is a point that I know a lot of you have been interested in. Peter Zihan been talking about it for quite some time. I do got to say, he was he was one of the first people I ever talk, I heard speak about this. Yeah. I didn't really believe it at the time, but he was dead on. Uh, the Chinese population now has fallen for a second straight year. Births dropping even after the end of the one-child policy. The number of deaths in China rose by 690,000 to 11.1 million, which is more than double the last year increase. Quote, demographers said that the rise was driven by the aging of the population as well as widespread COVID outbreaks from December 2022 into February of last year. The total population of China at 1.4 billion has now dropped to second place behind India, according to the overall UN estimate. And the major flashing red signal inside Chinese society is the falling birth rate and the long-term economic and societal decline. Chinese economy was built on a major increasing consumer-like market and sentiment. And if you don't have more consumers, then you can't have more of a market. Their problem that they have is that you have major middle-class promises and others that were built upon uh, demography overall increasing. And now the massive effects, the tail end of the one-child policy, the gender imbalance, the economic imbalance, and now their foreign policy plus COVID and all of that has made a significant impact to the point where this is probably the single biggest thing that they are thinking about, about how to reverse the effects of the one-child policy. And just to show you, you know, the economic problems that they're facing are one and the same with their demography ones. Let's put this up there. So for example, uh, the overall economy rebounded from 3% growth in 2022 which happened because of zero COVID. China, according to the official number, remember the official number is 5.2. But what they say is that other economic data shows that there's major weakening demand for Chinese products, which long-term is a major problem for them. On top of that, you have to remember property and home prices in China, which we covered a little bit during the whole Evergrande thing, is a huge portion of their overall economy. Right. They are rapidly declining with major bankruptcies and corruption investigations that are happening in the property sector, making the middle class dream, the Chinese dream, so quote unquote, that most of the current generation and their parents really banked on, not nearly as attainable. Corruption is still widespread. Then you had zero COVID, which devastated a lot of the economy. I actually called into question some conflict in the government. We saw a few protests and all of that there, but still incredibly rare. And really what we saw is that Xi at every turn has chosen authoritarianism over capitalism, which probably good for him in the long run, but not necessarily good for the economy. And it makes it so that this, just a link back to Taiwan, which we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Whenever, like nations, there's a common theory that like nations lash out and invade when they're on top. Right. That happens sometimes. Right. Kind of like America and the Gulf War, where we're like, listen, we can do whatever we want. Like that happens. But there's also a very likely story of when you're on the downswing and you know you're on the downswing, you want to move when you're as like close to where you're faltering as opposed to when you're at the bottom. And it leads to an urgency in your thinking where you're like, listen, our economy's declining, our population, all of this. If we're gonna reunify Taiwan, if we're gonna set up this uh, nation, which they look at themselves as a 2000 year old people for eternity and to move on forever and have the CCP like cemented in that same way that you would look at older Chinese empires. Well, we need to do it right now. They have a much longer time scale in the way they think of their own history and their own role in it. And for them, like they've seen this story many, many times times before, they don't want to repeat the century of humiliation of the 1800s. And this could be, in their head, the time when you want to act is now. So all of this, you know, actually links back to the urgency of the international situation and kind of what they want to do to cement their own legacy as we look forward. Yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah. no, to overly simplify things, you know, the incredible growth story of China has been built on this, you know, massive industrialization, you know, building out all this factory capacity, building out massively all of this infrastructure to the point that it, you know, became like some of the projects became mm -hmm. sort of ridiculous. Then now you can go and look at like the number of airports in these towns that don't really need airports yeah. and things like or that. Like so the fake villages. The, <laughs> right. So that running way has sort of run out. And then the next piece was the property boom and, you know, building out all of this uh, residential real estate and that becoming like a real, you know, part of like Chinese middle class identity. And that has, there's, that has sort of run out of runway. And now we've covered all these stories about Evergrande and this property bus.
West. And so, you know, the, the next thing would be, all right, well, we're going to move into like the U.S. consumer economy mode and uh, focus on services, focus on, you know, our own domestic economy, buying more crap, basically. And they've sort of rejected that direction. So um, I don't I think there is a, a real awareness, both in terms of where they stand economically and in terms of where they stand from demography, that this could be very much be the peak of their, you know, potential power and potential influence. So that, again, raises the risk that they may see it as like, you know, they've made no secret about the fact that they want to reunify with Taiwan. That They, they made a pledge yeah. that they will do it. That is, yeah, yeah right. I mean, that's not like, you know, a secret wish that's very much out there in the open and spoken publicly all the time. So the question is just a matter of timing. And, you know, I can't get inside their heads. I have no idea what they're thinking, whether they feel like now is the right time or not. But there are some indications that it's possible they look at this chessboard and they say, you know what? We could do worse than to act right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if, if think about it from their perspective. When's the best time to go? When we're in the middle of an election and there's all kinds of craziness going on, we're stretched you know, militarily abroad. We've got the Ukraine situation, the Israel situation, uh, all of that. You've got multiple carriers you know, in the Middle East. You have all of CENTCOM, which is like focusing on international Houthi targets. That's exactly whenever you and want And a country that's try deeply, deeply divided. divided. Yeah. Deeply divided right. along like very hard partisan right. lines. So, yeah. We'll see. All Scary right. situation. Hey, guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber, and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right. We're subscriber-funded. We're building something new. We want to replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So, again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.